everyone. Um, seeing quite a few soldiers still uh, holding on to the last sessions of the afternoon. Um, today, we're, this is the session where we're going to discuss the use of ultra low contrast in complex CTO. The, um, Faculty that we have to here today, I'm Mirvat al Asnaj, practicing in Saudi Arabia. With me is Dr. Ahmed Al Kharaza from Kuwait. He's our moderator for today. And of course, our presenter and uh, discussant, Dr. Roberto Garbo from Italy. We want to increase awareness on this concept of using less contrast. Our patients are sicker, many of them have some element of chronic kidney disease, and so on, and we need to just increase awareness. We want to learn the skills and tools that are available to us in order to deliver low uh, contrast PCI. And we're going to share with you a recorded complex CTO case and then where they used ultra low contrast. And then we get into the discussion about safety and so on. So we'll go ahead and start with our um, presentation, Dr. Garbo. Thank you, Mirat. I think that this is a really hot topic because we all know that we are dealing with the uh, complex CTO and we're dealing with uh, the problem of uh, uh, kidney injury that with contrast we can have. We need to think about uh, uh, not only about uh, the coronary artery, but we are dealing with patient. And for a long-term prognosis, uh, this is really important. So this I my uh, conflict of interest. Uh, well, let's, let's start with the definition. Of, so, I divide my presentation in two parts. The first part is the uh, theoretical part, the concept that we explain about uh, what is ultra-low contrast PCI, what can be uh, contrast-induced nephropathy, and uh, which are the measures we can use to prevent. And then we can discuss together, and then we go to the second part that is a case-based presentation. So definition of uh, contrast-induced uh, kidney injury is uh, an absolute increase in serum creatinine uh, more than 0 0.5 milligram within 48 hours, or more than 50% from the, from, from the basal. And the, the fact of physiology of contrast-induced uh, uh, kidney injury is uh, uh, multifactorial. So we have the contrast give some direct toxic effect on the kidney with osmotic nephrosis uh, and uh, uh, damage of, uh, uh, of the kidney, or with the release of endotelin and adenosine and the decrease in nitric oxide that gives uh, some vasoconstriction and ischemia of the kidney. The natural history, we, you know that uh, we can have short-term and long-term complications that are uh, severe complications. The incident, talk about CTO-PCI, uh, you can see here from many, many registry that Contrast-induced nephropathy is the most common and severe co extra cardiac complication in CTO PCI. And the risk factor associated to CTO intervention are patient-related or procedure-related. So you can see on the left the patient-related uh, risk factor. This is a previous chronic kidney disease, uh, uh, older age, female sex, congestive heart failure, uh, left ventricular impairment. Uh, uh, nephrotoxic medication or anemia. And the procedure related are high contrast media, the first one is high contrast media volume uh, or lesion complexity. So we have uh, both situations. So the contrast and CTO are two elements that can bring us to, uh, to increase the risk factor of contrast induced uh, kidney injury. Then we have even the hemodynamic instability. We have many many um, uh, CIN risk score. This is the most famous, this is the Meran right, uh, risk score that take in account uh, uh, some uh, risk factors of patient related like uh, and even of clinical uh, situation. So even hypotension uh, and as I told you before, diabetes are an element that increase the, uh, the risk of uh, uh, nephropathy induced by, by contrast, and the basal GFR is even, even more important. For the prevention of uh, contrast-induced nephropathy, these are the uh, European uh, guideline of 2018, and we will see step by step which are the elements that we need to take into account uh, before the procedure, during, and after the procedure. So before, uh, it's important the concept of high dose of statins, that uh, uh, we have seen that statin uh, 
uh, have also the concept of reduced inflammation, systemic inflammation, and they can improve the endothelial function. And this can be really, really important in the, uh, decreasing the inflammatory response induced by contrast. The vascular access site is another concept we need to take in account. So radial is better than femoral because with radial access we have a reduced uh, rate of major bleeding. So we reduce the concept of hypotension and even the kidney uh, stays better. So we reduce the hemodynamic instability. Even we can reduce the uh, form ateroma embolization from the uh, uh, abdominal aorta. Hemodynamic support, we have this study that, uh, that uh, evaluates uh, patients with high risk, patients on protected PCI, in which uh, the use of impella on respect of a control arm uh, leads to reduce uh, number of patients with uh, uh, acute kidney injury. So this is a study that is on support of uh, uh, hemodynamic support to reduce hypotension, but we need to have uh, more study uh, on that topic. Even tailored hydration with the renal guard. So renal guard system give uh, increase uh, the urine flow rate uh, during the procedure, and this is important for the kidney to avoid the risk of uh, uh, hypotension, so to reduce the volume of, uh, uh, of blood in the kidney, and so to reduce the effect of contrast. The contrast media should be uh, isosmolar, so your dixonol is the best one to, to avoid this kind of, uh, of problem. And then we, we go to the, the thresholds. This is the, uh, the oldest study by Laske, 2007, that uh, after the study we have a sort of volume to creatinine clearance ratio, and this is the uh, a concept that you need to, uh, to think about that. Uh, with this study, uh, even the guideline takes to uh, 3.7 uh, estimated G, uh, time uh, for uh, uh, estimated GFR, so the ratio is uh, three, under 3.7, but we will see that now we are much, much lower because this is the, uh, with this study, they show that with this ratio, we reduce the risk of having a problem with the contrast in our, our kidney. Then we go to the ultra-low contrast concept. This is a study, is an Italian study that show uh, or over three, 391 patients with primary PCI. They evaluate uh, all these consecutive patients, uh, uh, a different number of ratio of contrast uh, on respect on GFR. They have seen that uh, if the ratio is one, so you have the number of contrast, uh, the dose is uh, one on respect on GFR, we have a very low um, risk of having a contrast-induced nephropathy. And even in this uh, bigger, uh, uh, huge registry from Michigan, uh, more than 75,000 of patients that from 2014 and 2017, they evaluate uh, uh, which number of patients has this kind of ultra-low contrast PCI. So uh, the, with the ratio of one between GFR and contrast, uh, they've seen that the number is not so trivial. Is 13% of, of patients have this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, um, treatment. Uh, so it's contrast, uh, ultra-low contrast PCI is feasible and uh, with very, very good result on, in terms of long-term follow-up. We have this year the state of the art review by Ziad Ali that show the concept of uh, ultra low contrast PCI. So we need to identify high risk patient, and the patient is the patient with GFR less than 45 uh, milliliter of, uh, uh, of GFR without with the di with diabetes or GFR less than 30 if it's not diabetes. With the previous, uh, a patient with previous contrast induced nephropathy is another patient that we consider at high risk. And this situation, when we need to perform angiography, as you can see, we need to have uh, some uh, tips and tricks to reduce the number of co the, the amount of contrast. So we have uh, uh, need to be 
uh, careful with the catheter engagement uh, confirmation. Uh, we, have, we, we need to have a pre-hydration prior to the procedure. We need to, to use a low magnificator, no panning, as some very uh, small number of projection to evaluate uh, our, our uh, stenosis. And then we need to have a, a great use of uh, a functional assessment and imaging, because this is the concept. So we need to not to use contrast uh, to, uh, to, be, um, to help our uh, diagnosis, but we need to have a, a different uh, strategy to, to be sure that we are doing the, the best for our patient. And even for, for ultra-low contrast PCI, so when we decide to do the PCI, we need to, uh, to use intracoronary saline uh, on respect on uh, contrast, uh, workers wire, we need to use intracoronary physiology with co-registration, we will see later, or uh, IVUS imaging. And this is one example, that, so Philips give us uh, many tools on doing that, because we have the dynamic coronary roadmap, you can see here, we have a, we, a single angel on the left, and then we can put our workers wire with the, uh, with the, uh, in a knuckle fashion in order to avoid perforation. And then we can use dynamic roadmap in order to avoid uh, the number of uh, unuseful contrast injection. Then we can use the functional pullback, so IFR co-registration and uh, uh, IVUS co-registration to have a perfect diagnosis of our stenosis and then that can guide our procedure. And then we can use the advanced fluoroscopic device detection for stent implantation. You can see that uh, uh, this is really important because we don't need to inject to evaluate uh, where is our uh, balloon and our stent or we need to post a lead stent. So with this kind of uh, tool helps a lot to our, our, um, our strategy in order to reduce the number of contrast. So let's go to take home message and then we can discuss. We have uh, uh, many situations, many, uh, many tools that we need to, we can use to reduce the number of contrast. Uh, so prior to the procedure, intravenous hydration with normal saline is the only improving effective strategy to, to prevent uh, contraindued nephropathy. We, has, uh, we can try to think about hemodynamic support in high-risk setting patient or uh, the concept of using radial on respect of femoral artery. But the main concept is that uh, ultra-low contrast volume CTO-PCI strongly relies in imaging uh, and metallic road mapping with guide wire. And uh, uh, among the novel and creative procedural strategy, decreasing cost and volume is the key to reduce this kind of problem. So we would like this to be a very interactive session. So if anybody has a question about the theoretical part of uh, this important topic, uh, please uh, take the microphone and ask your questions. So what uh, anybody w knows what to expect if you inject a saline in the coronary to confirm your position? What do you see in the ECG or in the monitor? You will see a T wave inversions uh, usually in, in the ECGs. Exactly, Ahmed. This is a very important <clears throat> point. So, yeah. when you, uh, this is the concept of zero contrast PCI. Absolutely. So, we, uh, we need to think about ultra low contrast when, uh, when we have a GFR of 30 and we need to stay until 30 cc of contrast. And when you need to have a zero contrast, we need to avoid completely. The concept, and we can use saline to select the, the artery, and we need to, to evaluate the monitor, evaluate the EKG changes, and this is a, a, a sign that we are inside the coronary artery. We need to use uh, the roadmap of a previous angio we performed some day before. This is a very important point. And uh, uh, after that, we can use workhorse wire and in order to to, to place our wire exactly in the same projection we had before. So this is really <clears throat> important. And then imaging is the key. Absolutely. One uh, important, uh, I don't know, uh, I expect most of the people knows about this information, but Philips system also has the swing uh, arm. 
So you can do with one swing arm, you can do an injection with uh, less than 10 cc, and you can see the left coronary system in all projections. So that is a, another important thing with the Philips uh, uh, CR. Yeah, and I think co-registration, so using co-registration whenever possible with FFR, IFR and so on, also helps you minimize the amount of contrast. But one thing you said in your presentation that caught my attention, and it's so basic, that is set up the shot. You know, you, I look at my teen daughter when they're taking their pictures for Snapchat and so on, and they actually focus on preparing the image. And I think we're sometimes too fast and too sloppy. So if you center, you don't need to repeat, you can see the entire vessel and so on, and you can use just the amount of contrast necessary to fill the single uh, artery. So really set up your shot yeah, this and is, not be sloppy. This is a very important point, Mirvat. I think that, you know, that uh, doing CTO PCI, we know that we change completely the way how to do uh, the angio. So uh, no panning, so we need no moving the table. We don't need to, because uh, always, when you go in a in new cat lab, they are doing the case, they do the angel, they move the, pe the table because they want to see the distal LED. And this is not good because you cannot see what you want to see. So doing CTO, we know that we, we need single shot, no panning, low dose of contrast, uh, but we need to see then frame by frame what we want to see. So we don't need to do many, 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 of uh, injection. Even in CTO, we have a different concept of uh, that we are dealing with, and we will see later. We are dealing with subintimal space, so the contrast is harmful. It's not, not only for, for the kidney, but for the patient, because you, you increase the hematoma, you increase the, uh, do reduce the, the, the flow in your arteries, so uh, stop, stop to inject contrast. This is the, the the main, uh, the main concept. And the other thing, it might actually affect the interpretation of the, the, the imaging because you uh, have difficulty and distortion of the image as well. <laughs> and even for IVOS co-registration, a lot of physicians, they think that we, you need to inject contrast to, to make a roadmap. But uh, you know that by, with the Philips system, you can do with the, is a wire. The wire is a, uh, can be the roadmap. So you have the, the tip of the wire that the radio peak part of the wire and the guiding catheter, they are the two marker, and you can do IVUS co-registration or IFR co-registration without any CC of contrast. This is a very important point. So uh, if there is no more questions, we can take it to the next part of uh, a recorded case. Okay, great. So, sorry. And uh, please uh, feel free to interrupt uh, and, and ask questions. Otherwise, we will ask questions. So this is a case of a, a young man, 49 years old, with the, uh, multiple risk factors, so diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, previous smoker, that uh, had a moderate CKD, so uh, two milligram, two of creatinine, GFR is 45. So uh, moderate, not severe, but moderate CKD, very young, uh, with effort angina, since 2020, and in uh, December of two years ago, he has an uh, ACS with LAD critical stenosis and uh, mid-distal uh, right uh, occlusion. So he was treated in another center with the PCI death on the LAD, and the echo was normal, so 60% uh, of ejection fraction. Then he has uh, still effort angina, and they, they perform uh, uh, non-invasive uh, tests, stress tests. So in May 2000 of this year, myocardial scintigraphy with, uh, uh, that shows severe ischemia in inferior and lateral wall of extent of 16%, so FDS 12. So in June 2022, uh, in that center, they try to, uh, to open uh, in antigrade fashion the right, but they completely failed. So uh, they sent me uh, two months later for a new schedule reattempt. So this is the, the situation. Uh, this is a case of is a recent case of a young man with angina, right occlusion, a previous failure. This is the, the dual injection. So we have two guide, two seven guiding cut, seven French guiding catheter, amplat left on the right. Uh, 
ABU 4, 7 French, uh, uh, 90 centimeter for the left. Uh, you can see we have a complex right occlusion because we have a, uh, a strange uh, distal cap occlusion at the level of the cracks. We have an occlusion of the middle of the right, so a long occlusion, and we cannot, is a huge right. Uh, so, Robert. We are in this situation. So, so any, anybody would like to pick up the microphone and interpret the result and tell us how would they approach this case? Yeah, we want to be really interactive. So, thank you very much for being. Don't be shy. <laughs> volunteering. Uh, thank you, Roberto, for uh, this uh, excellent case. I, I, I think this is uh, a failed trial for right coronary artery with uh, high creatinine to. Uh, I think too. Uh, so there is a clear. Uh, I will collateral. interrupt you. A minute. Okay, yeah. good. Thank you. There is a clear collateral from LED, septal connection to this uh, BDA. So uh, in this situation, um, um, I would prefer to go retrograde with uh, wire in this distal right coronary artery uh, first, and then I can go anti-gradely. Uh, with uh, uh, microcasters and wires to make like uh, casing wires. This is to minimize the amount of contrast, for example. And uh, I can use uh, uh, the technology of Philips uh, to, for these collaterals. It will be uh, much helpful. This is my opinion. Thanks, yes, sir. This is a very good point. Uh, the, the first concept is that we know that on, uh, doing retrograde, we reduce a lot the amount of contrast. So this is a very important point we need to take in account. Uh, because, uh, you know, when you are doing anti-grade, we need to inject from retrograde to see the distality. Okay, when we are doing retrograde, we, we don't need, we, we don't have to inject. So this is a very important point. The second point is that uh, this complex case, if you go anti-grade, we, we know that we have a previous anti-grade failure. So, uh, they fail anti-grade, and then, uh, uh, but we know why, because uh, uh, when you have uh, the distal cap at the bifurcation, the cracks, uh, if you uh, insist in anti-grade, you have high risk of dissect the, the distal cracks, so uh, to lose one of two branches. So this is another important point in favor to retrograde. If you want to uh, comment, Ahmed or Mirvat. I mean, you, you explained it very nicely. I, I think the only thing I would say is um, also the right coronary, there's a lot of movement with the right coronary. It seems to move a lot more than the um, left system when you're working on it. And so it's very tempting when you're going, if you're going to end up going anti-grade through the right, to just keep injecting to get some kind of visibility as opposed to retrogradely from the left. But, you know, even in a non-CTO, the movement in the right makes it very difficult um, to follow. Yeah, exactly. In fact, you can see here seems to be uh, in two different planes, the right and the PDA. No, you can see it's really, uh, when I see the case, I said this case is really strange, really complex to understand uh, the entry point, uh, even from, from the retrograde. Uh, we, it's complex to understand where we need to puncture from the PDA to the distal part of the right, because this is a, it's not a classical uh, uh, crux of the right occlusion. So this is the, my, uh, my point. So we have a tapered proximal cap, long occlusion, straight, distal cap in bifurcation, good retrograde collateral, as Yasser said before, and uh, uh, that we have seen from previous angio, and the failure and moderate CKD. So uh, in my mind, this is a case for uh, IVUS guided low contrast uh, retrograde uh, PCI with anti-grade puncture. So we all agree about uh, this uh, uh, strategy, so we can go on to the, the case. I start retrograde, a single, uh, very, you can see here, very low amount of contrast, ju just two cc to, uh, to understand the position of. Uh, oh, Roberto, which wires did you use? This was a SUO3, SUO3. septal will, crossing with the turnpike LP retrograde. So we have turnpike LP 150, and the SWO, SWO 03 crossing. And then uh, from anti-grade, I start directly with the Gladius Mongo to knuckle because I know that we need 
Uh, as we told before, we need to make the connection in the distal part of the ride. So uh, we cannot do uh, uh, everything by retrograde. And uh, I put the anti-grade wire because there is a tapered cap. So in order in front of the distal part of the cracks in order to help my retrograde wire to puncture. So this is the situation. We have a Gladius Mongo anti-grade and uh, the Turnpike LP with the suo tree in the posterolateral branch, you can see here. Then we have a problem with the, with the puncture. So I tried, I removed the, the, the suo, I tried to puncture with the Gaia, I have no way to puncture because it was not stable. So I decided to, to leave the suo on the posterolateral branch and take a dual lumen microcatheter from the septal. So this is the recross, the new dual lumen over the wire with two lumen, two over the wire lumen, we can use two wire at the same time. And uh, uh, after the turnpike LP crossing, the septal was good to put the dual lumen retrograde through the septal. So you can see here, this is a registration real time of the advancement of dual uh, lumen microcatheter over the, the septal. And for doing that, we don't need to inject. So no contrast at all in that situation. We have, and then we have another advantage that we have the suo tree on the posterolateral branch that uh, help us uh, for, the, for the next step of the procedure. So then this is the, the Gaia tree puncture. Even this is a real time fluoroscopy registration. So uh, no contrast. Uh, even we have the second concept of uh, uh, radiation that uh, we are, uh, is another hot topic. Uh, we want to do this kind of procedure with the low uh, amount of, of X-ray is possible for the operator and for the patient. So we don't need to do angio, but uh, we make a registration of the fluoroscopy. This is enough. So because we have a very good, uh, with a very good Philips, we can have very good image on that. So this is a puncture of Gaia tree of distal cap and we have the suo wire in the posterolateral branch. You can see here, we have uh, from the, the antegate gladius, we have the, uh, the marker wire antegate, so we know exactly where we need to puncture from retrograde. We are in the same space, you can see here. And then from antegate, we have a trap liner for doing trap liner assisted reverse cut. This is a very important point, you know, in the, is the modern approach to CTO that with the guide extension, it's much easier and faster to make the connection. Because in the past, uh, when we start 15 years ago to do retrograde CTO, we need to, to go up to the uh, proximal right to make the connection. So if you connected in the distal part of the right subintimal, uh, you had to, uh, to do a very long procedure to advance in the proximal right. Now we know that with the get extension, we put the trap liner in the distal part of the right, and then we make the connection there, and we can enter with, re with the retrograde wire in the, in the distal, uh, in the trap liner. So in this situation, I perform reverse cut in subintima space, uh, and we, I was able to re-enter, as you can see, with the Gaia in the, in the trap liner. And then I perform uh, uh, externalization, and this is the IVUS. So we can comment if you want uh, this IVUS pullback. So only small dilatation with the two millimeter balloon to advance the IVUS. This is a volcano IVUS, a Philips uh, uh, Eagle Eye. You can see this is the PDA. We can see also the, the SUO tree. And then this is the crux. You can see that is we are subintimal at the level of the bifurcation because the Gaia puncture was subintimal, and we have the the. He, this is the bifurcation. You can see here the at nine o'clock we have the posterolateral branch, and here is a huge plaque that we have in the distal, in the distal right. And then we are in. Then we are in, in the middle of the right, at the end of the, the pullback, we are inside intraplaque again. So, so we, need, we need to face another problem that we know that will not be easy to, to take the posterolateral branch because we are uh, in the PDA, 
but we are subintimal at the level of the cracks. But it's, uh, it's important that uh, because he's using low contrast, uh, you don't see that there is expansion of the hematoma. The hematoma is small, so re-entry should be uh, easier. Exactly. Until this time, no contrast was used, you know, because uh, after the externalization, the patient is stable. It's very important because the, in this situation, I, I can inject from the right only if I have a crash of the hemodynamic situation of the patient. So if you have a crash of the patient, you can think about a, a huge perforation. This is the only situation which you need to inject because in that situation you need to, to solve the problem. But if the, the, the hemodynamic is stable, the EKG is stable, you don't need to do any injection that is, as Hamed said, uh, can expand the hematoma because we have the hematoma. You can see here we have a, we have a, a big, uh, we, we are subintima here, and the hematoma here is small because we, we, ca we, not, we, not, we not inject, but we, we have the subintima part of the, of the course. So after that, I take a dual lumen from antegrade. This is the only injection I did. You can see on the left system, a very small injection. Try to understand what can I do. Here, I take a dual lumen from antegrade and the ultimate bros. You can see the, the strange anatomy we have at the level of the cracks. In this situation, SUO3 helped me a lot to understand where I need to puncture without increasing the injection of contrast. But I failed to, to penetrate, uh, to puncture with the ultimate bro. So I change uh, uh, my strategy. I remove the, uh, the microcatheter from the retrograde. I take a balloon. This is a sort of uh, what we call in the past was a cart. So balloon dilatation from the septal, from retrograde, going to here, you can see here, to, to modify the distal cap at the level of, of the bifurcation, and try to help the penetration of antegrade wire. So try to modify the anatomy of the distal cap. And a puncture with the ornet. The, the ornet was able to puncture, you can see here. But the problem is that I have a fracture of the wire. So I have a, the fracture of the tip because of the uh, huge calcification at the level of the uh, of the bifurcation, the strange anatomy after the puncture, I need to push a lot. My ornate for you can see even the angle yeah. is really complex here. And then, so here we have the, the, the tip of the ornate fracture, and then I change with the Sion Black, and you can see how easily I was able to enter because after the puncture with the ornate 14. Now we have the small hole, Ahmed. So I was able to, to create a, a good passage and then changing with the soft polymeric wire like Sion Black was really easy. You can see here entering in the posterolateral branch. So ballooning the, the, the cracks or the bifurcation can modify the, uh, the angle and modify the disease. So if you look carefully, the, the fractured wire is in a slightly different plane than the uh, cyan black. So the cyan black is likely took uh, the initial puncture and then took another Exa channel. Exactly. So the <coughs> ornate puncture in the right way, and then it went outside yes, with subintimal. It, it and looks the cyan uh, black true take take the true because you know that at the beginning. Uh, uh, the, the cracks was, was, was free, so was, was the vessel Absolutely. was open there. So Absolutely. Uh, the ornet puncture and then went out, and then we have a sort of the fracture, and then the Sion Black easily went in the distal. Easily tracking the other branches, so you know it is a true lumen. So now, now we have uh, two antagonist wires. So we have uh, the, the wire externalized on PDA, the Sion Black on the, on the postlateral branch, and then we need to think about which is the, the strategy the next strategy of, uh, of treatment. So what do you think about, uh, any, about that Anybody now? has any uh, comment on the strategies or would they do uh, something different? Oh, yes, sir. What do you think about the, the next step of this procedure? So we are in a good situation. Yeah, uh, um, I totally agree with uh, preserving post branches. I think uh, it's very important for this young man to keep 
both branches open. So um, I like your idea to modify the cap to puncture to uh, this uh, BD and keep it uh, open. And I think if uh, after both the uh, after dilatation, if needs bifurcation stenting, I will go without uh, any hesitation to keep these both branches uh, open. And uh, I want to add something. Uh, 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 I, I like your way in, uh, in, in every step you do um, safe fluoro. And I think this is one of the ways to reduce the amount of dye. Because in safe fluoro, you inject one or two cc to see the course of the artery. And then uh, instead of a uh, uh, big shot to, to Seni with five or six, and I think at the end of the procedure, you will end with a uh, half or, or, or uh, 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 less of, uh, of total amount of dye. Right, and then, oh. then use of IVUS that, uh, you know, IVUS, uh, uh, because uh, when I am going to teach the use of IVUS in C complex CTO, many operators, they uh, think that uh, CTO are so complex that they don't want to use uh, to add complexity. Uh, the, the, uh, actually, it, it, the concept is different, that if you understand very well the IVUS image, you can understand that I would make more simple and safer your procedure, but you need to be sure on what you are looking for and what I was can tell you. So this is very important. What I'm explaining that uh, I think that imaging is essential in uh, the, the modern approach of PCI, every PCI, uh, we cannot avoid imaging. We know that we have a problem of economic issue and some time, but we, if we think about the importance of having a very good result, uh, having good uh, imaging is essential on that. Yeah, and the great value for, for IV is to minimize the number of the stent, and this is very important for the long-term results. So if I have a, a negative remodeling for the IVS, it's not needed to stent it, and it will improve after after. This is a very important point, yeah. because uh, when we, in IVS, you can see that if you have a big plaque burden, this is a concept of doing stenting of a drug eluting balloon, whatever you want. But if you have uh, under perfusion in CTO, you have negative remodeling, you have no plaque, and you need to avoid yeah. use of stent. Because uh, when, you, when you are doing follow-up, you have a big vessel, yeah. and uh, if you put a stent, you put a stent in a wrong way because the stent is small and the vessel is yeah. healthy. Yeah. So um, I, I will ask you a question, uh, if you don't mind. So would you actually take any contrast injection or a CINE, given the fracture and the wire position, to look for any complications or anything? Or would you be happy to uh, follow, based on the wire behavior and the previous images that you had, to not inject contrast? As Roberto mentioned, when the patient is stable and there, there is no hemodynamic compromise or there is no chest pain and the patient is stable, I will continue uh, my, my uh, uh, plan from the start to open uh, uh, both uh, branches and I will do IVS for uh, both branches and after that I can get one single injection to uh, see where is uh, 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 my lens of the stent uh, from BDA or BL and so on. Uh, oh, often, I, uh, <laughs> control is for self-reassuring. Yes. Yeah. The procedure, but Absolutely. No, yeah. this but is. A, this yeah. is a and and uh, it's important to to notice that the fractured part of the wire is dancing with the whole artery and the wire. So it is within the vessel architecture. It is not exiting the vessel. Exactly. Which is important. You don't have to inject a contrast. <clears throat> There's a point that you mentioned before, especially with CTOs, is injecting a lot will create hydraulic uh, uh, dissection, and so you don't need to do it unless you are you really it's necessary. It's not like just to get a, getting more comfortable because you can create more complications. Absolutely. So especially if if you, if you're using an assist device. Or, yeah. In uh, my experience, even if you put a stent, like uh, you have a long right occlusion, you put a stent in the proximal part, then you say, okay, I can inject. Be careful because you have the hematoma between the stent and the wall, and if the stent is, is not so big, you can expand the hematoma distally even if you put a stent in the proximal right. So this is important. But, but uh, another point is uh, um, that um, although uh, uh, it's not like, a, a, but not all IVOs and CTO are the same. 
uh, you were very, uh, uh, it was very nice that you closed the eagle eye short tip because other ibis, you have a, a longer distal tip and it will not help a lot to uh, in this kind of cases. Yeah, for me, so, so maybe <clears throat> uh, the resolution is better, but in CTO, this is the best ibis. Exactly. Well, exactly. Just because of the shortening of time, we'll, we'll uh, stop here and we'll ask Dr. Garbo to continue the, yeah, the lecture. Yeah, and now, we'll take the questions that we have two, bra <clears throat> two branches, I think that uh, the, uh, we have, this is the, the IVUS pullback, I will show you. And this is nice because show that both wires are subintimal at the level of distal cap. You can see here clearly because we puncture with the ornet and then, then here we are intraplug. You can see here. This is a very interesting IVUS because I go back to show you. We are at the bifurcation here. It is open, it's coming the, the, other, the other wire and then pulling back. Now we, are, now we are in. You can see, and we have the hematoma here, all around. This is all hematoma. So if we inject, we make the disaster. So we have two points essential. The subintimal, the distal cap, we have both wires subintimal, and then we have both wire intra, intraluminal, and proximally, we have a both wire intraplug, but with hematoma. So we need to do a bifurcation stenting, what uh, Yasser were, was saying. And this is essential, because if you are doing only one single stent, the other uh, branch will close. And then we need to think about that we have a retrograde wire on the PDA. And if we stent from the postural branch, we close, we jail the retrograde wire. This is a, 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 can be a big problem. So remember that. So we need to put a microcatheter from the PDA to remove the retrograde system and work with two wire integrate. This is a very important point. And then for me, the, the, the main strategy here is mini crash because with the mini crash, you will save both branches in the same, the same time. So we go back again. I can show you the last part of the IVUS uh, that is interesting. You can see here the second wire coming, all subintimal, and then here all intraplug with the hematoma from 3 to 8 o'clock. So mini crash, mini crash, uh, postural PDA, IVUS guided, uh, two wire antegrade, uh, final kissing balloon, final IVUS. Uh, this is the final only one shot from the left system. From septal integrity, everything is good. And the final shot from the right. You can see a huge right. Uh, both branches are open, and this is the final IVUS. After that, after stenting, we have post dilatation and, uh, and so on, and then I will show you a fixed image of uh, uh, the most interesting part of the, of the vessel after post dilatation. So here we have the pullback, and this is the the final IVUS, we can see where we have a distality that is, uh, uh, is not perfectly, is circular, but we have a subintimal part, so we cannot think about to obtain a huge vessel because in this situation we, need, we, need, we have the risk of perforation. So when you are dealing with stenting in subintimal space, we need to take in account that concept. That we don't want to have uh, the 100% of expansion, and in the proximal and the mid part is perfect. So. I want to, the protocol is that, well, a three hour of procedure, 1.8 grade, 48 cc of contrast, uh, and the creatinine after 48 hour is, uh, uh, is similar. So, uh, Roberto, this is a very uh, interesting uh, uh, case, and uh, the end result was very good. Uh, do you have any uh, take home messages for, for the, the? Yeah, yeah I have the, uh, just, Two slides, are, this is the IBUS utility on retrograde. We discuss a lot, so we can skip. This, is, uh, this case was IBUS guide or reverse car technique. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, even, and IBUS is essential for, even, for the, even for the problem of ultra low contact for stand siding to avoid antigen crash in injection, as we discussed before. The last slide is the slide of uh, uh, the benefit of IVUS guidance in CKD patients. These are a result of uh, ultimate trial. We can see here on the red line, 
patient with CKD uh, treated only with angio have 10% of MACE at 12 months, and patient treated with, uh, with IVUS, the, the MACE rate is uh, decreased from 10 to 3%. So this is important of imaging. I wait all of, all of you in Turin in May for a Turin City and Chip meeting. This is a, a live course that uh, is an international live course. And my, my last uh, comment is that uh, uh, this, we need to go much more and more to the concept of reduced contrast in our procedure because we don't need to think about uh, uh, only about the vessel, but we need to think about the patient. And we are dealing every day more complex patient with older age, diabetes, and with CKD, and we want to obtain the maximum for their, for their follow-up. And the use of uh, imaging, especially. I imaging is the key. Imaging for me is the key. I think so, that we need to, to use imaging always. So we would like to thank you very much for an excellent uh, overview, and uh, thank you very much for the audience.